Okay, I got this riser device uh, um, fixture on this great faceplate that Bill Chalanek provided to the channel here for incredible faceplate instruction <laughs> in the future. And one of the things I wanted to uh, talk about with faceplates is a lot more was done with faceplates before the invention of two milling machine attachments, the boring, head, the boring and facing heads and the tree angle cutting heads, for example. Well, on this faceplate, it's running within a couple of thousandths everywhere, or better. And it's running dead true on this piece, and I didn't have to uh, do anything to this. Now, I mentioned I could hook this up to uh, a milling machine rotary table to my 10-inch Yauza, or Yuasa, which is a, a bargain, high-precision rotary table of its time. So I've got a bunch of holes here, and I've done a bunch of things with this over the years. I've hooked up alloy wheels to this thing and uh, machined uh, the centers, particularly for motorcycles that have a single uh, sided uh, rear suspension. And uh, I was doing work for a shop that worked on that kind of stuff, and they could uh, <clears throat> wanted to adapt wheels from one model or brand to another of the same style and I could fit, <clears throat> excuse me, high pollen count I think is the problem here. I'm sneezing and everything. Well anyway, I could hook wheels up to this thing and other adapters for other things and um, one guy uh, for some reason had me take some steel car rims and uh, split them in half, like part them, right down the middle. And uh, he'd weld a band in them, and then he'd bring them back and want me to kind of machine them um, up a little bit. And uh, it worked out pretty good. He could make uh, narrow rims into wide rims somehow for, I can't remember what. You gotta be careful though. You don't wanna get sued for something that's gonna break on the highway and kill families, you know? A lot of the stuff that I worked on is for um, RVs, you know, off-road stuff. So I could hook wheels to this. I could hook uh, motorcycle engine cases to it. I could hook tr uh, hydraulic uh, pump to it, pump cases or hydrostat pumps, and even water pumps just things. And <clears throat> this steel piece uh, will take uh, a real baiting and uh, take uh, the, the mounting more towards center. And a lot of times you have stuff that's kind of big but uh, needs to be boosted up to, uh, and it pops off easy. So this is a really good thing to do. Now this is what I used to do almost all the time with these things. And I've got a perfect thing to show uh, an odd shape that I've dealt with. And it's a cool thing to look at, but I haven't really worked on this particular item and it's rare. Okay. I think I showed it on my old channel. And what this is, is a supercharger. <laughs> it's a, a McCulloch supercharger. And uh, years ago, they put these on motorcycles, and I don't think it worked out too good, you know, but it looked cool and stuff. And um, they'd built drive them off, uh, off the motor somehow where the generator mounted. But this is a brand new military one from World War II. It's unmolested. <laughs> it's got all the locks on the, on the screws. But if you're working on something like this, you can see its odd shape. And it's really hard to hold in a milling machine. So it would be easier 
to do a lot of operations mounting this thing on a faceplate or something like that against the faceplate, clamping it here and here if you had to face something to kind of tighten it up or something, uh, rebuilding it or something. The way these work, there's two rotors and they're gear driving here, gear driven. So if it's pulling down this way, it'll be a turn like this, and it brings the mixture down to the outside here, the outsides, and forces it out. <clears throat> and the veins fit real tight in the middle here, helping uh, prevent uh, internal leakage. And these can build up pressure. That's why they call them a supercharger. But you might think that's pretty neat. I do. I don't know what to do with it. Make a, a dragster lawnmower? <laughs> I don't know. This was over at the scrapyard, and I go, what do you want for that? They go, $5. I go, okay. So, <laughs> there it is. Okay, now, what changed me from doing that to using the milling machines is the wall hopter head here. I could do the facing and everything, actually cut uh, grooves, just about do everything with this thing, like laying like that, clamped down to the table, boring, everything, just about everything the lathe does. Then even cut tapers with this attachment here. The fabulous tree, angle cutting head. <laughs> well, these, these things were extremely expensive. This head here was $4,000 back, back in the 80s. And uh, this one here was $10,500 now, as for a sip jig bore. Now, I'm thinking uh, it's about 19. 94, I'm thinking, 95 maybe, that uh, Boeing went from using the SIP jig boards to some CNC process, uh, making the airplanes or whatever they're using this for. And these ended up in the Boeing surplus store. I'm getting a horse to have to get something to drink. I will be right back. Okay, I was talking about uh, going from uh, using a faceplate to using the jig bore and also horizontal mill using these attachments. Now, at the Boeing Surplus Store, they had these kits like this. And, oh, gosh, they, they didn't want a lot for them, but, the, but it was a lot. It was something like, you know, 1200 bucks for the complete kit, which is an incredible bargain. But they had this stray one sitting in the case there. And uh, they wanted, uh, it was less than 300 bucks, I think, with no attachments, nothing. And, uh, and I bought this one. And looking at the attachments, there's no attachments <laughs> that I could have used. So this was just an incredible bargain with that much money off. But people didn't really know much about these except they were cool and go, yeah, I need all the attachments. Well, the attachment you may need, like I did, was this one here that wasn't in the kit. I had a little bit of a counterbalance facing bar that I was facing the motorcycle uh, crankcases with, which was a big money getter for me. And it was so much easier setting the crank crankcase half down on this jig bore on the rotary table, sitting on that mount, then spinning it on that mount on a faceplate. See to me? So that's what industry discovered years and years ago when these things started uh, happening. Now, automatic facing goes back to the 1800s on boring mills and machines and the store. 
oh, advanced system, which they managed, the Germans here managed to get it into an incredible compact package with the wall hopter head. And excellent ones are made in Japan too. They're just fantastic. They're, they're very, very good. And I think even um, they made them in Poland and Czechoslovakia and France, I think. But I don't know if they made ones like this in France. The uh, Inco Gamut facing head was always in the old catalogs and stuff. But uh, these were pretty uncommon just because of their cost. And this one, this one here is a, uh, uh, a SIP item. And I mercilessly sawed off the shank, the SIP shank, and adapted it to um, standard bo uh, boring shanks. That way I could put on anything and I didn't have a set jig board go with the $300 head. So that's how I solved that problem. It was worthless to me without mutilating it, but the mutilation <laughs> turned out good and it works great in this machine. Both spindles, the 50 horizontal and the 40 um, vertical. Now this machine here uh, it, it works great on it if I keep it balanced, reasonable, and run at a slow speed. This is a rigid machine, weighs 4,000 pounds. This is a 5-inch head. It's too big for a bridge port, okay? It's just too big. So, uh, it, uh, it's almost too big for here, but it works fine. It works real fine. This is a 5,000-pound machine. It's, it's very happy over here works really good here of course this is not a hogging thing i don't think this is a finishing tool used in jig boards and stuff and uh, i think they still manufacture these things so i kind of wanted to explain some of this stuff how this uh, is and if we're looking at it now if you want to do this with a five inch head which will cover what this machine and an eight size up will do uh, with a face plate. You're going to have to have that machine, okay? And probably that to do tapers if you want to do tapers nicely. You know, you can also, uh, this is nice for doing uh, internal grooves and things like that that you can't normally do easily uh, with the standard attachments on the milling machine. Like the uh, standard uh, boring heads that are right there. See? So, this replaced uh, that, I suppose, in the 1950s or something like that. And then this got re replaced by CNC in about the mid-1990s, I think and became available to small shops, you know, because everybody, uh, these things started uh, getting on eBay and uh, the Re Reliable Tool um, website that's long gone and stuff. So this stuff was out there, and uh, I don't know, I think the, the kits and stuff were about 1200 bucks, but that was a lot of money back then. And I don't know if the prices are changed. I certainly haven't been in the market for this stuff for a long time because this works. Now, one of the reasons I wanted to get, get back to using a faceplate is, one, it's really nice uh, way to do things, and it's really quite accurate. And another is a lot of people have never seen it. And uh, just weird things stuck in and using the faceplate and stuff like that. And I think it'll be good for a lot of people that are watching this uh, that don't have this stuff. You know, <laughs> there's 10,000 pounds of machine <laughs> behind me to get away from using that. I hope I made a little bit of sense on that. I'm going to load this video because I think it's kind of nutty enough to go, wow, that's kind of weird, yeah. I can do all the stuff that that jig bore and that huge milling machine can do 
on, on the lathe that I got real cheap uh, off Craigslist. <laughs> like this thing, right? <laughs> okay. I will be back.